is um, we're trying to create a national inventory of legal materials, a spreadsheet, if you will, a database of all primary legal materials at the state and also at the federal level at some point. And um, it started off with California, Eric Wayne and the folks at Stanford um, started off doing an inventory through NoCal, the AA double chapter for California. And AA recently has kind of joined in to encourage, uh, we've created these working groups for librarians in different states to join because AAA has been very involved over the years in concerns about um, access to le in, uh, electronic legal information, issues about authentication, permanency. Um, and Joan's been very much involved in that. So she's going to give you a little bit of an uh, introduction into what AAA has done in the past with some of these issues. And then I'm going to go into a little bit about the work that we've been doing, Joan and I and other people in Massachusetts, on our own inventory as part of this larger project. Well, States. it sort of started, it says 2003, but I know it, took, uh, it started in 2002 because I was one of the um, state authors for the state-by-state state report on permanent public access to electronic government information. And AAA um, was aware of the fact that um, with the advent of electronic information, it was possible to make more legal information accessible. The problem was to make sure that it was permanent. Uh, at least that was the first thing we were looking at. And um, here in Massachusetts, we were making it all permanent because we weren't making any of the electronics, so that worked pretty well. Um, <laughs> and, and that was pretty good because there were, what happened was by 2007, AAA did their state by state report on authentication of online legal information, um, legal resources, I guess it was called. And um, by then, five states had already stopped their, um, their paper administrative registers and went strictly to electronic sources. The problem with that is that they hadn't thought at all about the notion of permanency or authentic, uh, authenticatability. So um, in 2007, to take these not in the order that they show up, I think, is it on there? In, in 2007, um, AAAL held a national summit on authentic authentication of digital legal information. And this was, um, they presented the findings from their survey and they invited lots of players from federal and state government and from all branches of government and um, people who were really interested in this issue. And one of the best things that came out of it, in my opinion, was the fact that one of the participants was one of the national commissioners of um, uniform, uniform state laws, and she asked them to make a study group, which they did, and the study group um, made a proposal, and the conference of commissioners has now got um, a working group on, um, on drafting standards for the authentication and preservation of um, electronic state legal materials. So that's part of what you've been asking for as a solution. Some of the players have already, some of the big players have already started. The, the um, commissioners have, have followed their procedures to develop standards that will allow that to happen. Um, what else is on our thing that we didn't? Oh, um, you want to click on, on, the, on, the, on the lovely. I, I, uh, does it want to show up or not? I wanted to show the lovely um, pamphlet because I helped write this one. That AAA did in 2007 um, adopt principles on, no, I can't read the title, principles on um, access to electronic legal information. Can you flip to page two? And um, we decided that these five. Um, it's, these things are all, we think these are all essential and we, we're trying to get this information to all the makers of um, uh, legal information to make sure that they know that what they produce has to be accessible. I, am, I have to tell my favorite story that I just love this story. Um, it has to be a long time ago, but when the Massachusetts Register was not very old, like it was about eight to ten years old, um, I had a, a, a patron who needed some regulations and she couldn't find them anywhere and I called the agency on the phone and they said that they'd send them to me and I asked why their rates weren't in the CMR and I'm talking the paper CMR in those days and she said, well, we change them so often we decided it's better not to publish them. Oh. <laughs> and I said to her, how do you expect anyone to follow them if you don't publish them? And luckily for me, I can't remember what agency this was. It had to be a small agency that I didn't deal with often. 
But I thought, oh my goodness, you know, that was really the biggest case of inaccessibility I've ever seen. But if you're old enough, as some of us are, the mass, the CMR didn't exist until 1978. So before that, you really did just call all the agencies and ask them for their regs, the way you still have to call most of the agencies to ask them for their opinions. Um, that it has to be reliable, that the official status is something that we're, um, used to be a, a given when everything was in paper. It's, it's very difficult now to figure out what's official and what's not, and, and harder. That it, it needs to be comprehensive, and that it has to have a view to the future. That um, another, when, you're, when you're really old, you have lots of stories you remember, but I remember when um, the Secretary of State of Massachusetts decided to improve the way the CMR was updated. And it really was an improvement in the updating of the CMR, but it totally destroyed historical copies of the CMR. And um, I know in my library we have like a six month to a year gap where we just actually don't know what the rates were during that time period because we didn't do a good enough job of preparing for that change. So that can be multiplied by zillions of times as more and more stuff moves electronic and is very fragile and temporary. So luckily, AAAL is working in, on a lot of fronts, including the working groups, to go back to the PowerPoint, to, um, to bring us back to what we needed. And I'm going to put this somewhere so people can follow the links to all the documents. So that's on. OK. So, so as for today's session, we're going to and um, so Joan and I um, and a few other people um, in Massachusetts have started working on the inventory. We're very, it's very, very much still a work in progress. But we thought when we were having this event today, we'd share some of, these, some of the things we found so far. And none of them are really that earth shatteringly new. We kind of already knew that they existed. Um, and we're just kind of raising issues um, that we think are important for people to know about in Massachusetts in general. So what are we looking at in this inventory? We're looking at the scope of, a con of the content. So for example, if a, something's available on a government website, they, is it just the current edition? Do they make available previous editions? The format, are they making the content available um, only in HTML? Are they making it available in PDF? Are they making it available in XML, which could be used for various purposes? Copyright assertions that um, publishers try to make on works. Um, there's a general notion in Massachusetts that legally copyright's not an issue on state materials as it can be in other states, but when you look at a lot of publications, there are a lot of copyright assertions. Terms of use, sometimes um, different publishers, um, they might make their content free available on their website, but they might be onerous terms of use, so that as Carl was suggesting earlier, if you wanted to try to take that content and do something with it, you'd be limited. The costs involved in trying to maintain certain type of materials or access certain materials. The issues of digital authentication and permanent access, was, which Joan raised, raised. Currently, I don't think Massachusetts is dealing really right now in pending legislation with the digital authentication issue. And just to turn, and we were also just kind of looking at the whole sense of access in general, just how usable are these materials that are on the web for real people um, trying to use them. Um, so overall impressions I have thus far, and I think Joan would share them with me, is that um, Massachusetts is doing an okay, I'd say okay, not great, but okay job of uh, making uh, current material available, but there's not as much access to older material except where libraries or other entities have maybe stepped in and, and had efforts to make that content available. One of the things that's frustrating about Massachusetts is it's a very diffuse system. So the content might be available, but it's available in many different places. There's not a centralized portal or place or, or office or something that's responsible for, for pushing the material out or creating standards so that everybody's doing things the same way uh, or on the same page. And as I mentioned before, the other thing that um, it, 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 the impression I have is there's a lot of copyright um, statements on materials. Now, what that actually really means legally is kind of a separate issue. But it's interesting when you look at the various uh, materials, especially things like municipal ordinances and such that have copyright notices on them. So one of the things I wanted to raise, and I'm going to actually show you the website because it illustrates it better, is um, the SJC website for reports. Uh, 
Um, so one of the things is you can get uh, SJC decisions for free, but only in certain formats. And um, one of the big concerns is that um, if you want to actually access the advance sheets to the SJC decisions, which are what have the head notes and the, the proper pagination for citation for citating the official reports, it's actually by subscription because West actually does the printing for the advance sheets and they also provide, I think, the content for this particular service. And um, I think this is the link to the pricing for it. Yeah. So you can see this is the different pricing if you wanted to try to get the pricing for it. You'd have to pay $170 a year if you had only 15, up to 15 attorneys in your organization. But it can go up to $510 if you're, you have a larger firm or organization. So that to us is you know, problematic because you know, should this content really be behind the paywall? And I think the SJC or the people responsible would argue that there is this opinion archive and there are other forms of the decision available, but really to have them not available um, with the head notes um, for that interim period of time before they're in the bound volumes is, is problematic. Uh, the other thing is um, a lot of the lower courts. Um, some of the lower courts actually, even though that you know there's there are different issues with the precedential value, but you know still people have interest in looking at lower court trial court decisions. And um, even though they're available, a lot of times they're not available necessarily from the court itself. For example, um, superior court decisions you can get slip opinions from social law library back to a certain point in time. Um, and other than that, you actually have to pay for something like the Massachusetts Law Reporter, which is a commercial service that's put out, um, or have access to Lexis and Westlaw to access such content. And again, that's problematic because you have a lot of people in the superior courts that might want to access that content um, that are limited. Um, the other, so moving on to the legislative branch of government, um, Massachusetts does make its general laws of Massachusetts available. Their print edition is actually published with uh, West, which I'll show you an interesting issue um, in a second. Um, if you look at the website, You'll see huge disclaimer on the top. <laughs> so somebody trying to use it, an actual patron use it, and a person in real life pro se trying to use it gets this very daunting message. Yeah, 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 you can use this, but you know you really can't rely on it. And double A would actually like this because this really isn't an authenticated version of the text. And they're very concerned. Part of what they want to do with these working groups is do this inventory to make sure that you know websites that where the information is not authenticated, it is clear to the person using it that it's not the official version. But from a user perspective, that's um, very discouraging, I think, um, in terms of um, usability of the information. Um, also has a nice little suggestion about contacting a lawyer. And uh, the other concern is, um, well, First, they don't have previous editions, so if you wanted a previous compilation from a previous year, there are instances where people want to know the status of the law from, let's say, four or five years ago. Um, you can't do that on their website. You can look at the session laws back to a certain period of time, but not the codified version, which is generally the more usable version for, for general, generally applicable laws. Um, and the other thing is the time date, which I'm not sure, maybe some of my colleagues from the state libraries know why it's not as up to date as 2009. I didn't know if it had something to do with there are certain rules about effective dates in Massachusetts, how many days before a statute's actually effective, and I didn't know if that was part of the reason why um, the, the currency, currentness might be an issue. Uh, but that's another issue in terms of the usability of the website. So it's there and people can use it, but it's not necessarily the most ideal um, way for people to access the information. The other uh, interesting thing is the copyright statement, because and it's a statement that it's copyrighted by Massachusetts and Thomson Reuters. And then when you go further, I didn't bother putting um, the text up, but in the 
preface part, it, it talks about how the editorial editions, um, it talks about all the different things that aren't in the original general laws and that are, it's implied that West has added them. So it's a whole issue of what if, if we as a library wanted to go ahead and just you know, scan the general laws and then make them available on um, what kind of copyright claims can they put on the editorial information and, and what would we have to be concerned about. Um, but it's interesting because people generally, patrons have the impression that you know the general laws are copyright free public domain and like I said in Massachusetts, copyright on the primary legal materials is considered to be a non-issue but this is our official code put out, you know, jointly printed by West with a little bit of editorial, very little. And um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so it's interesting to see the copyright notice there. Maybe Carl or others would have thoughts about that when we get on to discussion. And then Joan's going to talk a little bit about her impressions. Well, um, yeah, this, well, the first thing is that there is a searchable CMR that the state runs on the web that is, of course, not official, and they want to charge 110 bucks to search it. And, um, and I don't know why. And good luckily for us, the trial courts are, have, have put links to all those regs that, that are out there on the free web from the agencies, but um, they're not in a searchable form. They're just there. And then there is the, the problem that, put the little reference standards, that the, um, the, um, the Carl mentioned this earlier. Somebody mentioned it earlier. I never remember who said what, including me. But that um, the CMR itself is full of all sorts of standards that cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to buy and that you can't reproduce. And um, there needs to be, I mean, it's not just that we need to redo law, we need to redo the way standards are paid for in this country. That basically, this, the, 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 um, the revenue scheme from all the standards organizations has been, it's not showing up. Hates me. I always hold it, take a long time to upload because it's a big beauty, yeah, that's a good reason. Um, but this is just a page from the CMR, it was actually about six or eight pages from the CMR that lists all the different standards referenced in the building code. Or actually, I didn't use the building code, I used the plumbing code. I don't, one of the codes. And if you have to go out and buy all these standards, which you have to do, it's thousands of dollars. I don't know how anybody complies with our rigs because I don't know any plumber who can afford to buy all this stuff. So um, it takes me back to the, you know, why do we publish, why do we pass these laws or these regs if we don't want people to follow them? And um, older regs. Oh, I, I mentioned that earlier that you can't get, well, there's actually a microfiche version of the old CMR that you can buy. You can't get them electronically. Uh, you can't get an older, older version of the code. And you can't even actually get to all of the mass registers. There is actually a, a I, I, I have still, there's still about 20 or 30 issues that I've never found in the mass register that now that you take them apart and file them, when everyone did that, when they came out, I don't know if anybody saved a perfect copy that we had. You do have one? The Hampshire Law Library does. I love them. I love them because there have been times in my life when I've said to a patron, I can't help you and I don't know where you can go to get help. You, you never, you never, you saved a complete set. Thank you. I tried to get my library too and I was overruled in my library. They thought that was a silly thing for me to want to do. So, go figure. <laughs> Governor Romney, under him, was the one who actually started the charge. I do believe it was free before Governor Romney, so we had okay. free access at one point. We needed money. Well, and that, that, I mean, part of the, when I did it, back in 2002, when I was getting all the information for the survey, money was the big issue. That a lot of the Massachusetts information is in databases, and it's dynamically generated web pages, and it's awesome information that they could make available but don't want to, and that at the time in 2002, my concern for them was, were they saving it in some way? Was there a way to find out what had been in the databases at certain times? And the state library had come to our aid and said, yes, yeah, or not the, our aid, meaning the people of Massachusetts, not me personally, um, that they started archiving stuff on disks or on floppies or on CDs or something just because they said, this, this information will be lost if we don't just start saving it. And so they have a lot of it saved, but there's, again, no money to make it publicly available is the problem. It's the kind of content that patrons need all the time. It's very real life, applicable content. Do you, Marty, is, is there any sense of how much money they actually make <laughs> from the CMR service? I mean, I, I can't be imagine it's that much. <laughs> I have no idea, yeah. and we don't use it. So. <laughs> 
You know how we won the, um, the Federal Register fight? Um, when we finally found out the total revenue the government printing office was making on all the official journals of government, the Federal Register, Code of Federal Regulations, total revenue was $220,000, um, <laughs> including 17 grand that we had spent. We so the minute Congress figured that out, they said, why are you bothering us with this? Drop the paywall. That's all it took. I do want to point out that, uh, by the way, my name is Linda Hamill. I represent the Information Technology Division for the state of Massachusetts. If you go to Mass Regs, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about this. Our constitutional system of government, we have all these constitutional offices. They control their own electronic domain. The CMR is not controlled by the executive department of the governor, but by the secretary of the Commonwealth. Right. So if at, at the time of the Romney administration these charges were imposed, they would have been imposed by a separate elected official, the secretary of the Commonwealth. Uh, and it's one of the things that I'll be talking a little bit about this afternoon, that we don't have any central content czar who can come up with rules about open access across the enterprise because we have all these separate constitutional offices. But you do have you do have the state archivist who is in is it state archivist? Secretary of the Commonwealth's office, not under the governor. Right. Yeah. Right. But that, and they're the people that are really in charge of making sure. I mean, everything that gets thrown away has to go through their office. I mean, you have to get permission to, to toss your stuff and stuff. It's awesome. That there are there are there are laws in place that pr that provide for permanent preservation of these of these materials, and it is through the Secretary of State's office, not through the government governor's office. That's right. So um, the other thing we noticed was looking at the agency decisions. Um, they're really all over the place. As Joan suggested before, um, she, she did a little research and she did confirm that most agencies still are only, the decisions are only available for inspection. Um, they're not really published. Um, I'm looking up here because my screen went out, so <laughs> just bear with me a little bit. Um, the agency is very greatly in terms of the availability of the content, and it's available in a lot of different forms, print, on the web, um, commercial services. Um, a lot of the older content in particular, thanks, um, got tied into commercial publishers. Um, and that's one of the things that struck me in terms of going back to the issue again of what if you wanted to do some great project for some clinical or something like that and, and take the decisions and make them available. Um, you would really only be able to do it easily for a certain period of time for the ones around the website, the agency that do make them available on the website because for earlier, even though the decisions in some cases go back into sometimes even the 70s or the 80s, um, there are issues because uh, land law publishing has published a lot of them and um, they have a commercial electronic service and then a print service and they claim copyright on the content. So again, maybe it's an issue how relevant that really is. Um, but it's just, it struck me in doing the inventory that, you know, for current material, you're fine, but for older material, it's a lot less accessible without, um, without the costs. And, you know, for this kind of information, a, a person doesn't necessarily need just like the current five years or 10 years, they need to know what the whole body of law is for a particular agency. And the other thing that we haven't done yet, but that I'm really anxious to do once we've actually gotten through the whole inventory is, I, it's been just an impression because I haven't really had time to really look at it carefully, but there seems to be a lot of differences in the scope of the decisions that are covered in the different sources in terms of the land law publications versus the things that are on the website. So it would be really interesting to do some statistics to see like what kind, uh, how many decisions are available in each type of sources for a given agency. The other thing we did is we oh, go ahead. I just want to say, it, not just agency decisions, but uh, Massachusetts is actually in a pretty good space with in terms of other executive things. In a lot of the other states, once a new governor or attorney general takes office, they try to remove all evidence of their predecessors, which means removing executive orders and attorney general opinions. And we're in pretty good space here because our um, our stuff is still up there, even from previous administrations, which is which is amazing and awesome. So somebody is paying attention, I hope, and, and listening and keeping stuff available and not taking it away. Because it's not just getting it all there, it's keeping it there that's a big issue. And it's just really interesting because, like, for example, I know when I was looking at the Housing Appeals Committee decisions, there was this big disclaimer on the website saying, if you want all available decisions, you must go to Lexus or Westlaw or Land Law, and these are only the recent ones. And it's just, it's just very interesting from a patron perspective to see that information presented that way. 
So we're also are trying to do an inventory of local laws, um, municipal and ordinances, town bylaws, but because we just started the project, of course, we haven't had time to go through all the different municipalities and, and towns. So we just tried to do a quick survey of a few of them. Um, and what was really interesting is it jives with what was Carl's found in, in other places in other states is um, there are a lot of copyright claims on the content. And, and then what's really interesting is um, the people that were helping you with the project, there were a lot of discrepancies between what was claimed on a given website or publication versus what the vendor themselves said. So for example, I can't remember what town it is, but one town on their website, they claim copyright, but when the person helping me contacted the town's clerk office, they say, oh no, we don't have copyright, and then vice versa, another one. Another town had no copyright claim on their website, yet when they were contacting them about pricing information and things like that, they were told, oh, you can't just go ahead and copy it because we have copyright on it. So it's really interesting the different information that's conveyed and I think how much thought's put in by the vendors and the publishers and, and the notices that they put out. Um, but again, it goes to the issue of what if you just wanted to take this content and try to make it available in some other way because in some of these instances there are also terms of use on the websites that you can't um, actually do things with the content. Um, and also, um, a lot of these sources are online now, but there are a lot, a lot of uh, disclaimers that the online version is not official and is very out of date, um, even more so a lot of times than the mass general laws. And um, if you want to get a print publication, you actually, in some instances, if it's not sold through the vendor, you have to actually, like a Unicode or something, you actually have to go to the town clerk's office to actually purchase. So even from a library's perspective, if you want to have the content in your library, just trying to acquire it can be difficult. And the costs aren't insignificant. They, can, they seem to be ranging between $100 and $300. So. so this is just a list of the biggest commercial pub, uh, publishers and vendors in Massachusetts. It's been really interesting. Uh, Lexis, I was noticing with the attorney discipline reports, again, they're claiming copyright on the content, which is really interesting. Um, so those are sort of the bigger issues that we found doing the inventory, and I would love to have conversation with the librarians here about you know, whether they'd be interested in participating or any other issues they think that we're going to encounter that we haven't discovered already. And if people are interested, I can also show you what the inventory itself looks like. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Does anybody want to help with the inventory? Join the party? It's, it's very interesting from a librarian's perspective. I mean, like I said, I went into this knowing I knew about the CMR, I knew about some other things, but when you actually, because you know when you help people with real problems, that's when you, that's when you notice these issues coming up with the uh, structure of the content or the availability of the content. So. Can you share a draft of what you've developed so far? Yeah, if you want, I can show you what the spreadsheet um, looks like. And hopefully, I didn't feel comfortable because we're so early in the process. And like Joan and I said, it's not ready at all for prime time. And I don't even think it's ready for like midnight cable station or anything like that. <laughs> but um, I, I can show you what the spreadsheet looks like. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that I think there's a lot of, to the librarians that are here, I think there's a lot of potential um, to create synergy with other projects that we're working on. For example, in Massachusetts, we have this B2F2 program going on, collaborative collection development program with a different area, academic law school libraries. And um, it might be something that there might be certain types of data that where, where we have this master inventory that we're using for purposes, maybe for Carl, for AAAL, that we could use it for other purposes. For example, I thought it would be interesting in some instances, especially with the ordinances where you know not a lot of libraries in a certain area are going to have a copy of like a local town order except maybe for like the, the public library in the area. I thought it would actually be interesting to go in and uh, list which particular libraries might have a particular publication, or if we're going to be canceling certain titles, we can have lists of who, who's the record holder for that so particular title. I yeah. volunteers, and because it started out of AA AAL Working Committee, somehow we've got to get past that and say you can be involved in the Working Committee even if you're not a AA AAL member. Oh, oh I, I think, think that, that would be fine. <laughs> I don't think that message is yeah. out there, yeah. and that you can take on a small part or whatever, so I think we need to be yeah. better. 
Yeah, let me make that message really clear. This was actually started by Paul O'Neill and Erica Wayne at Stanford. It is very much a grassroots activity, and we're, we're very fortunate uh, that the AAAL is assisting in that. On the other hand, uh, this is very much grassroots, and I would encourage anybody to adopt a jurisdiction and make a statement as to what the state of that jurisdiction is, and to do so in any way that is comfortable. And I mean, it could be this spreadsheet, but if you prefer a Microsoft Word document or an email message, I think the important point is to get the information out there. And this is an awareness raising campaign. Um, so I, I don't, you don't have to be a member of anything in order to participate. So this is the spreadsheet looks like. So it, this is very still much in the early stages, but these are all the different uh, things that we're trying to look at, which is why you can see it's a very time consuming project. But I do think that um, having worked on it now for a little bit, that it, it can have a lot of applications. Um, so I think once we actually have that, and I also think we could do really interesting things, which I wanted to do, but I just I didn't feel the DAF data was valid enough to do it with visualizations in terms of the information. Like I would love to do with the administrative decisions, some sort of visualization to, to explain like where the content's available for certain, certain date spans and, and things like that. But I think that the potential here um, for libraries to use this and just all sorts of different type of people, the general public to use it is really great, so. And speaking of standards, I'd like to have us develop standards for this. I mean, we're looking at a, a spreadsheet that I filled in and I'm not sure of all of my data. Some of it I'm sure of and some of it I'm not. And I would love to get more input from more people, um, especially the agencies that are involved and um, people, just other people's opinions of, of who really owns the data or who's doing what with it. You know, this is based on what I could figure out, but I've been known to make mistakes in my life. There was a time when I was young and made, made, made no mistakes, but now that I'm old, I've made quite a few. So tell me about the Code of Massachusetts regulations. It's $110. Is, um, two questions. Is copyright being asserted? And has anybody forked over $110 bucks and just crawled the site and made it available? I mean, this yeah, sounds like an undergraduate sure. health site thing, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, oh, the, the just NGL is available on the, um, their website now. Um, I've called it and several older versions they have on the site. Um, uh, budgetary information and proposed bills that are going through. I have an of that if you'd like it. Okay. Um, that's not the paid CMR, though. That's no, the legislative not. website. You're talking about yeah. the secretary's yeah. website. But, you have to pay. The legislative website is free. But, so it probably is easier to follow. But is that the same as the CMR? No. Is no, no, no. Okay, that's okay. the quote of that's yeah. regular. Right, right. The regulatory okay. But the CMR, I am shocked that, that there isn't an undergrad someplace. I mean, how many universities are there in, in Boston? Well, because okay. most of our law students access it on Lexis and Westlaw or through our subscriptions at Social Law Library. So most of the people who would want to break in have access to the data through some other paid vendor so that people haven't seen the need. Because the law students being on Lexis and Westlaw is the same as being free, even though in the real world, Nothing could be further from the truth. But citizens of Massachusetts don't have access to the CMR. Well, they have access to parts of it. I've been a trial court lawyer, it's may correct me to get this wrong, but we have access in our law libraries to the social law version because the legislature pays money to the social law to put it up and create it. So we negotiated back and said it's public money creating this. So the answer is in 17 locations, if you show up physically, you can actually have access. Now, now you might correct in that when I just said that that going into the libraries they've got can yeah. have access to the social law. In the seven, yeah. But that's still sort of paid for. Sure, and I mean, yeah, they, yes. I, going into your libraries they can access it through Westlaw and Lexus too. Correct. correct. Yeah. That is correct. Is it physically as long as you physically show up in your library? At they one point, social law was charging us, and we fought back and said, "No, wait a minute. This is taxpayer yeah. money. We're taxpayers' entity, sort of." I finally won that one. I'm interested in the person who's scraping the legislature website. So are you are you making those available, or are you planning uh, a 50 state I, project? Well, or? Uh, no, my plan was to, to make them better format them and, and analyze them. I'm mm -hmm. scraping for the purposes of doing sexual analysis and mm -hmm. oh, presentations, especially over time. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to see if I could see bills over your past legislation actually impact and trace it back to the impact on on one version of law versus the next year's version. But uh, as again, I've just scraped it and done some basic cleaning of the data. 
Yeah. You know, the single most powerful thing we've been able to show people in Washington, in the White House, and in Congress, and, and the judges, um, is something called OregonLaws.org. Um, when the uh, state of Oregon sent us a takedown notice for having the Oregon revised statutes, <laughs> all we had was a big zip file. And we went and testified, and they waived the searches of copyright. And about six months later, a 2L at Lewis and Clark, who had a comp sci undergrad, took the Oregon Revised Statutes and created this just absolutely amazing, beautiful user interface with semantic searching. And I mean, it's got everything you could possibly want. And that's an example of the kind of innovation that happens when bulk access is provided to the data. Um, we've also seen the same thing on the uh, Federal Register. There's been a whole bunch of groups out there like govpulse.us and fedthread.org that have taken the Federal Register and done some really amazing things with them. And that's, that, that hits home when you show that to a judge because they go, wow, this is way better than what they had. So, <laughs> so I have a question for Carl or anyone else that copyright expertise. What do you think about the notices that they're, like the, especially the general laws one? Uh, I, I, I know Phil Malone is going to deal with this. Uh, uh, Jamie Boyle has dealt with it. Uh, Professor Pat Samuelson dealt with it. Look, I'm not a judge. I, I'm not even a lawyer. I'm a law school dropout. But <laughs> my reading of the public policy of the United States, if you start at Wheaton v. Peters and you move along and look at the Supreme Court decisions, is that there is no copyright in the law. Now, you know, there may be copyright in a driver's ed film from a state. Um, but the law, um, and, and at all levels, my, my understanding, and this has not been definitively ruled, um, is that, that there's no copyright in that. Um, now, one of the big questions is, do we need to amend the copyright law to make that more explicit? Right? Do we need a one sentence, you know, section 105 amendment that says the law has no copyright? Uh, but certainly for the state legislatures that assert copyright themselves, right? Not over a vendor. That's a more complicated situation. But the, but when the state asserts copyright over their state statutes, um, that seems rather speculative. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it, does, it seems so counter, to me, it's counterintuitive that if we want people to follow the laws, you have to make them knowable. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't still understand why they want to, why that's all of a sudden some wonderful revenue stream for them. You know, this issue is so easy to explain. It's something that if you're sitting in a bar having a beer and you turn to the guy next to you and you explain to him what's going on, they get it immediately, right? And, and the common reaction on that is, that's really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's also interesting, I think, because I think the public, I mean, people who work in Massachusetts government, Joe can correct me, but I mean, I have the impression in Massachusetts the public records laws are pretty good. I mean, the stuff it is clearly you know, statutory required to be access, uh, made available. <laughs> and then the issue is just how accessible is it really? So, you know, you can have these wonderful public records laws where, yeah, theoretically somebody has the right to go in and get the information, but if you're not actually making it available, um, that's a separate issue. So maybe we need to be doing more in the state to strengthen, you know, those requirements. Because there are some publishing requirements, but not as many, I guess, as there could be. Now, you know, there's one other important thing to remember. When we went and, and discussed the issue with the Oregon Legislative Council, um, he told me something very interesting. He said, you know, that's a 1945 law we're talking about here. And it turns out in 1945, the only people that looked at the Oregon Revised Statutes were lawyers. And they looked at printed documents. And it just wasn't an issue. And the idea that ordinary citizens might wish to consult those or, or even technical standards. When I put US patents on the internet, one of the main arguments from the commissioner of patents is nobody's going to want to read this. Why are you taking away our revenue stream? Um, because the only people that are going to access it are a bunch of patent lawyers. Now, that, that turned out to be wrong. Right? It was engineers and computer scientists and others were reading those patents. But, but a lot of what we see in the current situation is simply the fact that, that that's the way it was in the 70s and the 60s, and it kind of made sense. And I think part of our job here is to kind of make the case as to why it doesn't make sense anymore. Well, we're a little early. We have lunch coming at 12, but we can break a little early. So if anybody um, wants to help with the inventory, please grab me or email me. Um, lunch is just going to be on a table outside. I'm not sure if it's actually there yet. If it's not, you can just know about restrooms are to the right outside the room. So we're going to have lunch. You can have lunch in here. You can have lunch outside. And then uh, we'll come back at 1 o'clock for a couple more sets of speakers.